Good morning, everybody. Excited to see you all. My name is Felix. I'm the host of the Forward Guidance Podcast on BlockWorks. And I'm excited to be joined today by Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and James Seyfert of Bloomberg. Great to have you guys. So we're going to be talking about the great ETF debate. And just a level set here before we get into it, I just want to run through a few numbers just so that they're top of our mind here. So we've had the Bitcoin ETFs launch in January. It's been about 10 months now. We've seen 18.7 net billion net flows from BlackRock IBIT alone. There's been 21 billion. And on Grayscale, we've seen a net outflow of 20 billion. So starting off here, I want to reroute to something that Mike Ippolito started to say in his opening remarks, that the Bitcoin ETFs have been the greatest success ETF launch of all time. Obviously, if, that was, if it was that simple, we wouldn't be having this debate. So I want to start the conversation by asking a simple question. And we'll start with James. Have the crypto ETFs been a success? Uh, crypto ETFs? Bitcoin and... I would say Bitcoin, yes. They've been a smashing success. The U.S. Bitcoin ETFs, I, the, a, a lot of data will show that it's like the best launch of all time for an ETF uh, and, and an ETF category. Uh, the Ethereum ETFs have been the exact opposite. Uh, I wouldn't say they've been a complete failure, but they have been nowhere near the level of success that Bitcoin ETFs saw. I would agree with that, that, you know, if you were to measure it by flows or by interest, that the Bitcoin ETF, of course, it had a, a running start that you had a closed-end fund with $30 billion convert to an ETF on day one. Most ETFs start with nothing. So this industry started with a lot of money and a lot of interest to start with, but it has been a big success. Yeah, so I want to start the discussion by focusing more on market impact and adoption of who is buying these ETFs. And let's, let's focus in here for a bit on the Bitcoin ETFs specifically. <laughs> what have we seen in terms of who has been buying these Bitcoin ETFs? Um, is it consistent with what we expected in, in the lead up to the launch of the ETFs? And where is there been some potential negative factors? So Jim, maybe we can start with you of just breaking down who are, who are these people that are buying the Bitcoin ETFs? And is that in line with what you expected from the launch? You know, I didn't have a real big expectation at the launch, but I know that the industry had an expectation that, you know, was summed up by here come the boomers. And it, I don't think it's really been that at all. Uh, if you take even BlackRock, has noted that 80% of the flows that they've gotten have come from online accounts self-directed. And it hasn't necessarily been from retail, um, excuse me, from wealth managers or from 401ks. So the $18 billion you've seen that has net flown into the industry adds a lot of adoption with new products. It's usually cannibalizing from somewhere else. And I think where it's been cannibalizing a lot of has been on-chain. A lot, I, you know, CryptoQuant has done an estimate of that's been 13 or $14 billion of that 18 was formerly on-chain and just moved back to their TradFi account and bought the ETF so that the net inflow is much, much smaller for the impact on the industry. Um, and so if you also look at the uh, 13 Fs, some, the 13 F is any institution of over $100 million that has to file with the SEC, that about 85% of the ownership of the Bitcoin ETF is not from a, uh, from a 13 F filing. So it is somebody is either less than $100 million institution or most likely it's, it's retail. So that's who's been the big buyer of it. And like I said, I think most retail basically took their, their coins off out of cold storage and then they moved them onto their TradFi account and they bought iBit. And that probably explains a lot of it. Yeah, I'd say, I do think there was, I know for a fact I've talked to people who specifically took money that they had in a wallet or on Coinbase or Gemini, you name it, and moved it into an ETF because that they could put it in their TradFi infrastructure that they have set up with their uh, wealth manager, their advisor, or they just wanted it better for estate planning purposes. I know that happened. I, I think the 13 to 14 billion is probably an overestimate. I don't know how you get the actual number. Um, I, I mean, where did we think the Bitcoin was going to come from? I mean, no matter how you slice it, it was going to have to come from somewhere. And there was undoubtedly, like if you look at when BlackRock first filed, right? Bitcoin is trading around 20,000. All of a sudden, it starts shooting up. There was a lot of people buying Bitcoin in the lead up to the ETF that were just buying it because they were betting on the ETF getting approved. So those people aren't necessarily going to hold it forever. They were probably selling it immediately within the first couple months to, to capture that premium. We got to 40K, and then we made a run from 40 to 70, an all-time high after the launch, like a month after the launch. So I think there's a lot of money. There is a lot of retail. The one thing I would say is there also is a lot of advisors that have bought this thing. My, by my count, there's a little over $2 billion, 2 to $2.5 billion. Uh, one and a half is an IBIT alone. 
that is the most successful launch over the last two years for an ETF to get that much advisor assets in the first two years. So yeah, it's a small percentage of the total dollar amount that is in these, in, in these products right now, but it's still an absolute smashing success. And also, it takes a long time for these advisors to be able to buy these things. There's only one wirehouse. So the wirehouse are these big platforms, the brokerages, the banks that uh, control trillions of dollars in wealth. The only one that has allowed any of their clients to buy this or any of their advisors or brokers to buy it for their clients is Morgan Stanley. And even within Morgan Stanley, you need to have a certain dollar amount, which is, I believe, over like $2 million or $1.5 million, and you need to have extremely high risk tolerance. So like, there's all these restrictions on who can and can't buy it. So it's a lot of the small RAAs that have bought it. Um, and honestly, even if you look at the big ETFs, like GLD, for example, the number is low, right? He said 80%. I think that's right. It's roughly 80% retail, maybe a little bit less. Hedge funds are a huge player here, which we can get into too. Um, but like GLD, for example, only has 40% of its holders, which is the biggest gold ETF that's disclosed on the 13F. So it doesn't necessarily mean this is just like people that are coming in and are going to leave immediately. We, we've seen a lot of really good behavior with these, with these ETFs so far as money has come in and come out. Yeah. So, you know, there's obviously this dynamic that we're talking about in terms of the, the market impact and the price impact. But I would love to just, you know, still focusing on the Bitcoin ETF for now, focusing more on some of these, these crypto ideals that, that started this entire project here and where that sits in terms of adoption of more TradFi institutional, um, you know, ETFs. Is this in line with the ideals of crypto? You know, these ideas of, you know, not your keys, not your coins, self-custody. But if, if we're disintermediating folks from that by, you know, putting them more into ETFs, is that a net good for the space? Is that inevitable or is it a bad thing, Jim? See, I think it's a bad thing. I think that, you know, the first two panels we saw, we talked about decentralization, permissionless, owning your own, owning your own keys. And if the idea is that the public is interested in crypto because they don't want to do any of that. They want to own it within a regulatory structure. And they want to have some level of permissionless of permission imposed on them. Uh, and, they're, and they're okay with sharing their keys with their brokerage account. I think we're missing the ideals of what we're trying to do with crypto. And if indeed the argument is, is that the public is rushing into these ETFs because that's what they want, then the industry needs to start looking at what are we trying to do here? Are we really just trying to recreate, um, you know, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs? We already have J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. We don't need to recreate them all over again. Or are we trying to recreate a different type of structure? So maybe it is a clarion call to the industry that as much as the, look, I've been in this industry for seven years, I remember what it was like trying to buy, you know, in 2016 and 2017, and it's orders of magnitude easier. But maybe if, if the argument is we need this regulated permission structure to get the wealth managers and the boomers to come into this industry, it's telling us we've got a long way to go in order to get to the ideals that we were really trying to uh, achieve here. Yeah, I want to make one point that I forgot to make before I answer that question. I, I also want to say, like, if we look at BlackRock's IBIT, like the 13F filings, there's 641 filers that we know of. If you look at any other ETF launched in the last like 18 months, none of them are even close to that. Most of them have single digit 13F file. Most of them have double digit 13F filers. The highest I could find was like 42. Many have zero. So like this is getting institutional demand and it's early still. On your question, I actually agree with everything Jim just said, but also at the same time, it's permissionless, right? Like, you can do what you want. Like, this is a free market. And no matter what you're going to do, you have to, at some point, TradFi and DeFi are going to overlap. And you can see the likes of BlackRock and Franklin Templeton and Bitwise and Fidelity. They're going to build these bridges. We're seeing it in both directions, right? We're seeing these TradFi companies taking these DeFi assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, wrapping them in TradFi wrappers, TradFi technologies, ETFs, and they're distributing it to people who are still on the TradFi rails. And we're also seeing things come the other way. We're seeing money market funds put on this TradFi traditional way of accessing yield. And they're putting it on DeFi rails with like BlackRock's Biddle Fund. I know Franklin Templeton's doing stuff. There's a lot of... So, so these TradFi managers, asset managers, and banks, I think are going to play this, these bridging mechanisms between the two ecosystems, the old school and the new school. And I, I don't know... There's no way around it. I don't think... There's also the fact that like there's plenty of people who are in their 60s, 70s, you know, if they they're never going to be fully on chain, in my opinion, the vast majority of them are just going to stick to what they know. 
And I think bringing these DeFi assets to them on the TradFi rails is a net good. Um, does it hurt adoption? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's going to get people more interested. Um, you also have now the largest asset manager in the world in Black, the largest asset manager in the world in BlackRock, um, basically preaching for your bags when it comes to Bitcoin and Ethereum now. You have Fidelity up there, which is also one of the largest asset managers in the world. So you have these big institutions behind you, and there are some drawbacks. It's not you know, the ethos of what Bitcoin and Ethereum were started as, but I, I do think it's a net positive, not net negative. Yeah, to your point about 13F filings, you know, when you look at something like the, the IBIT 13F filings, the top holders, it's, it's a lot of fast money hedge funds. And you know, a few numbers here, Millennium owns 370 million, uh, Jane Street 230. So, you know, there, there's institutional adoption, but I guess the big question, this is something Jim, you bring up a lot, is, is are they buying it because they believe in Bitcoin or are they buying it because of a basis trade that they can earn a yield on um, and, and delta neutral. So do you believe that there's actual institutional adoption because of the value proposition of Bitcoin, or it's just another trade? Oh, I mean, there is institutional adoption because of the value. But, I mean, the names you mentioned, you know, Jane Street is the market maker. And so that, you know, is pretty much why I think that they're on the list. And if you look at the hedge fund adoption, it's actually larger, I think, still than it is from the wealth manager adoption. And a lot of that's a basis trade. Basis trade is not a directional trade. They're just playing the arbitrage between, say, the CME futures and the spot price or the spot price to, um, you know, the, the on-chain price to the um, ETF price. So they're not in it because they, you know, they're not in it for number go up. They're in it to try and do some kind of um, uh, an arbitrage in there. Um, yeah, but within that, there are some that are, you know, showing interest. Um, you know, state of Wisconsin pension plan is, is um, showing some real interest in owning Bitcoin uh, and has bought some Bitcoin. And that's good um, for, for the adoption. But the unfortunate reality is the state of Wisconsin is one of the probably better managed public pension funds in the country, um, meaning that it's, it's fully funded. Most aren't. And if you actually are running a properly managed pension fund, you can do things like look at maybe a, a exposure in Bitcoin. The vast majority of public pension funds are a mess and they don't have the ability, even if the managers are sitting there saying, you know, I think Bitcoin's got some prob promise. They're so under the pressure to meet short-term needs. They're underfunded. There's probably corruption in a lot of them. Look, I live in Chicago. We could talk corruption all day long um, within a lot of these public pension funds. And if you're going to wait for them to get to Bitcoin, it's going to be a long time. They're still trying to keep themselves out of jail right now before they even get to Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other uh, than that, I have no opinion on the public pension industry. <laughs> uh, I won't comment on the public pension industry. I agree with everything Jim said. The one thing I would say is the, the hedge funds being there are a good sign. Um, yes, they're huge holders. And yes, it's almost certainly due to the basis trade. We basically go long the ETF. You short the futures and you roll that month to month to month and you earn that spread. It's also, they're doing it because there's an arbitrage opportunity there. It's the reason that ETFs work, right? The reason ETFs, their price and nav always stay in line, unlike what we had with those trusts from different providers like Grayscale, where they could have those huge premiums and discounts. It's the hedge funds that are in there, the market makers that are in there that make it efficient. They make sure that price and nav stays tight. And also, it's making sure the rest of the pricing of Bitcoin, whether it's futures or anywhere else, is going to stay in line. You have this... You have billions and billions of dollars of capital making sure the market is efficient. And also with an ETF, if you talk to any asset manager, I mean, all they, what they really care about is their flows and assets because that's what they make money on. But when you launch a new ETF, like the number one thing that's most important is if you can get volume. Volume is absolutely critical. It's like chumming the waters when you're going fishing. Like if you don't have volume, it's very hard to get those bigger fish, these pension funds we're talking about. They're never going to touch these ETFs if they don't have the type of volume that we're seeing from IBIT and GBTC and these other things. So it's a very good net positive thing for these ETFs. Does it mean immediately that somebody's going to throw this, all these pension funds are going to throw billions in? No. But this is kind of a prerequisite. You need to have a lot of liquidity for these funds to consider investing in these products. Um, so it's kind of like the way I think about it is, yeah, there's a lot of people here. There's a lot of trading. But the reason ETFs work is because everyone has to play under the same rules, right? With a mutual fund, there's all these different share classes. If you have enough money, you can get lower fees. You don't have loads. You don't have all these restrictions. With an ETF, your grandmother's buying the same product as Citadel and Millennium. Like everyone's buying the same thing and playing in the same pool. And it adds to this level of liquidity and grows the ecosystem. It's kind of like, yeah, 
Are there a lot of people trading it? Yes, it's kind of like a busy hotel lobby or a casino. Yeah, there's a lot of people down there. There's a lot of movement going on, but there's plenty of people just up sleeping and chilling in the rooms and holding it long term. Okay, so I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk more about the ETH ETF. And I, I think there'll be more agreement here than disagreement between the two of you. But just want to run through some numbers so far on the launch. We've seen a total of uh, half a billion in terms of negative outflow total. Uh, the BlackRock ETH ETF has seen 1.19 billion positive uh, ETF flow, and the Grayscale ETH uh, has seen negative 2.96. So I want to ask, why do you think there's been such a difference in the terms of the success of the Bitcoin ETS versus the ETH ETS? I know, James, you're all obviously very positive on the Bitcoin ETS, but not nearly as positive on the ETH ETFs. So what's the difference? Why is there just way less adoption of it in success? Yeah, so I will say that our estimates, we thought that over the first 12 months, the Ethereum ETFs would do something like 15 to 25 percent of the flows that Bitcoin ETFs did, which I got ridiculed by ETH maxis for saying that. And I was so far wrong. I was way too bullish. I mean, time isn't up yet, right? So there, there's a few things that Im impacted this. One, they launched in July, just six months after the Bitcoin ETFs, when you have all these advisors, retail people, institutions that are just like wrapping their heads around the Bitcoin ETFs. I think, I think the Ethereum ETFs would have been better off launching like later. Like if the SEC had to deny it, it might have arguably been better time for them to launch. They launched in the middle of the summer, the doldrums. Um, also, Ethereum was in a downtrend. It was not doing well. Uh, the market is not great. When Bitcoin launched, it was on this huge upswing from 20K to 40K. to 70. So that all helped build on momentum. That helped create the, the ecosystem that we saw Bitcoin ETFs become the largest launch ever. And then finally, there's a few other issues. But the number one for me is that there's no staking in these Ethereum ETFs. So you had a lot of retail investors, a lot of people taking money off chain, like Jim was talking about. Likely billions came from, I don't know, Gemini or Coinbase or Kraken or what have you into the ETFs. People who understand this and are staking their ETH would never go to mm -hmm. an Ethereum ETF because you're giving up that 3 to 4% yield or whatever it may be. So I think the yield part is, the staking part, the lack of staking, is, is a huge detriment to the Ethereum. Um, but at, if this thing starts running, you're going to see people not jump aboard. But yeah, the, all those reasons, I think that it's, it's hindering things. I also think it's going to be slower burn. It's, it's more complex. Mm. This, this is the final thing. Like, Bitcoin, it's digital gold, digital store value. It's very simple. People understand it. There's a, a little bit, it's a little more complex to explain what Ethereum is and is trying to be and is going to be. And I think that also kind of hinders it a little bit. Sorry. So um, I agree with a lot of that. And I want to just emphasize that in life, it's always better to be lucky than to be smart. And the uh, Bitcoin ETFs were launched in January, a few months ahead of the halving. And the halving really helped to kind of propel the price up above 70,000 to get a lot of people all excited about it. And as James was saying, the ETH ETFs came when we were in a bit of a downtrend. So I don't think that um, anybody that was thinking in early January when the ET Bitcoin ETFs are being launched, great, we're doing it three months before the halving and that will give us a tailwind. But that's exactly what it wound up doing. And the other thing you find about with the ETF um, buyer is they are very, very fee and yield sensitive. Um, you know, why is it that, just go back to Bitcoin for a quick second, why did 20 billion come out of uh, the, the Grayscale Trust when it converted to an ETF and 21 billion or so went into IBIT? Grayscale is 150 basis points fee and IBIT's 30. So it matters. It matters a lot. You might argue, yeah, but doesn't this thing move 3 or 4% a day? Why do I care about 150 basis points over a whole year? Because that's the mentality that an ETF buyer has, it's not, it's not unsimilar to the mentality of people that buy gasoline. How many times have you been in front of a big expensive Mercedes train to take a left-hand turn because that gas station's two cents cheaper than this gas station? You might go, well, that's less than a dollar difference, but we're just kind of hardwired to doing things that way. So fees matter and yield matters. You know, the ETH ecosystem has staking, has lending, has borrowing. You can do something with your ETH other than hodl it and earn an interest. And something like 40% of ETH is now staked. None of that's coming out and going back to their brokerage account to buy one of the ETFs. So they've lost, they've lost that opportunity as well too. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo what Jim was saying, which is the point I didn't make as well. You lose more utility by taking Ethereum and putting an ETF wrapper than you do taking Bitcoin and putting an ETF wrapper, in my, as far as in my view. You obviously lose some utility. You don't have sovereignty over your coins, what have you. But there's a lot more things you can do with Ether than you can do with Bitcoin. So that also hinders it. 
Nice. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the other traditional finance um, products that are coming out. We've, we've recently had SEC approval of IBIT options that will be launching. We don't know exactly when. I think I've, I've seen a tweet from you, James, that it looks like it, you know, it won't be at least until the end of the year, likely. But that's coming. I want to ask you both, you know, there's been a lot of speculation of, of what that impact will be on the market and also just whether it's a good or bad thing, whether we are going to start to see options be more pervasive in the market structure. So what's your thoughts on the impact of options from here on, assuming we get this to, to fully roll out in early 2025? Could I ask you to... Is, are zero DTE coming with them? And maybe explain what that is. Yeah, zero day options, zero day to expiry. So options that basically you could trade that are expiring same day. Um, I would assume they would be allowed. I don't know. There's nothing explicitly saying they won't be allowed. Mm -hmm. So basically we saw these filings and I, they, they were due by the end of September. Uh, and then everyone withdrew them. That meant the SEC was likely conversing with them. And we saw refilings where they, were, they changed all these things about limitations, about how much of these options you can hold. So that's definitely what the SEC and CFTC were worried about. They were working about, worried about manipulation and who can do, like, manipulate the price of the underlying asset. So you can't hold more than X amount of these options and depending on the expiry. So that's what all the changes were that ultimately led to the approval. Um, I think Zero's DTE will, will be in there. Um, I guess... I'll, I, I think it's a net positive. It goes more to what I was talking about with the hedge funds being in there, that more activity, the more ability to do things. It, when you look at ETFs, there's, there's some ETFs that we call pseudo-future ETFs. There's like, we break them down into liquidity levels and how they're used. And if you look at something like SPY, the S&P 500 ETF, or the Qs, or the NASDAQ 100, um, HYG, the, be, the high yield yep. ETF, that, those things trade and have their options are so liquid that they're not even just used as like, I'm buying this as a fund. They're used, they're used in place of derivatives and all these other things. They're used as plenty of different things. So I think having the options is going to add to that liquidity metric that we can see on IBIT and these other ETFs. And also, it'll possibly we're going to we already have them now. We have these covered call ETFs and these uh, put writing ETFs that are out there on Bitcoin. I think the ability to write options on ETFs is going to help get some advisors comfortable with the space. The number one thing that a lot of people don't like about Bitcoin is the volatility, yeah. specifically the downward volatility. So if you, can, you know, if you can more accurately use options, the current options only available right now are on Bitto, which is a futures ETF, or some leveraged futures ETFs that are they're not exactly, um, the basis can get messed up, so they're not like for like with the underlying asset. So having the ETFs add options I think will allow people to basically manage their risk a little better. Um, I think one thing you might be hitting at is I've seen a bunch of threads about how this could cause a massive short squeeze and Delta and, and Gamma. Yeah. I, I would downplay some of those risks there because we'll see. But um, for the most part, I think it's just a net positive. And I guess theoretically it's possible we could see something like a short squeeze that could be aided by the uh, addition of options. But um, I think the, the lower, longer term type stuff is more of a net positive. Within the options community, if you look at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, over half the volume now is in zero DTE options, up from you know five or six years ago, less than a quarter of it. And a lot of that zero DTE options, again, these are options that were initiated this morning that uh, cl um, you know settle at the close, um, are on ETFs, as you mentioned, SPY, HYG, QQQ, and the like. Um, that has gotten a big uh, discussion within the TradFi community, whether or not we're seeing short squeezes, gamma squeezes, and the like, within the $30 trillion stock market. And the answer is, to some degree, here and there, yes, just here and there. But is it, is it pervasive? Not really. Now you're going to introduce that to a $2 trillion market or a $1.5 trillion market, in Bitcoin, and could you see more gamma squeezes and short squeezes and everything else, which would just cause more volatility in the price? A lot of people want that, but if the argument here is, you know, that I want to be a hodler, I want to be a long-term holder in this, is that going to help get people to want to be holders in it, or is that just going to get more people more interested in just doing very short-term kind of gambling type of strategies? So, yeah, I think that the, you know, the the options are coming. They will create more volatility. They will create more liquidity. Um, will they create more hodlers? It's an open question right now. Yeah, and I would say if you're, if you're out there and you're trading zero, zero DTE options, um, Citadel and Jane Street and Virtu are thanking you because they are, <laughs> they're lining their pocketbooks with, the, with that money. Yeah, right. Ken Griffin says his regards for sure. Um, right. 
Great. Well, as we wrap up here, I just want to really hone in on where I think that the biggest disagreement lies, and it's it's largely around the ideals of crypto. You know, Jim, I want to I want to get your f first thoughts here as well, just really honing on this idea of of where we go from here on out um, over the next you know 12 months. Uh, like we were mentioning, we we have the spot ETS, but now we're also going to have options. All of that that's that's further moving people away from the original crypto ideas. Do you see these ideas at risk as it stands if you continue down this path, or do you feel like this is just going to be this this side idea as it merges into TradFi, and then there's going to be the on-chain ideas that are continuing? Um, let's start with there. Yeah, no, I do see them at risk. Um, Peter Thiel has a great line that he talks about that he's never totally pessimistic or he's never wildly optimistic because in both cases there's nothing you could do. If you're totally pessimistic, you can't change it. And if you're totally optimistic, you don't have to do anything. Um, I'm very bullish on this industry because this industry needs to keep continue to develop, continues to need to change, continues to need, meet needs. In fact, that's the, as Ippolito said, that's the kind of the, um, the watchword of this conference is change. Uh, I'm very against a lot of the maxi arguments because the maxi arguments are we're done. There's nothing more we need to do. We don't need any more developers. Just hold it and wait for a million dollars on Bitcoin. It'll get there only if there's a lot of change. And what I'm afraid of with this industry is let's take all our money off chain and let's just hold it in iBit in our Fidelity account and let's just sit there and wait and someday it will be a million dollars magically and no one will have to do anything to get there. It's a lot of hard work I had to get there. We can get there. But if we lose that sight that you're trying to build a new financial system, you're trying to build a better payment rail, you're trying to build some alternatives to what we have, and we just say, screw it, let's just huddle this thing and just wait, then we're never going to get there. And that's what I'm afraid of when I hear a lot of the mentality talking about why we've got to get into these uh, ETFs. There's nothing wrong with the product, it's just that the mentality then kind of loses sight of where we're trying to go. Yeah, and I realize I didn't answer your question about the timing of the options before, but I, I think before the end of the year is possible, I think it's likely in the first quarter of 2025 yeah. that we get options available. But unlike the SEC rules, the SEC has strict deadlines. Mm -hmm. The CFTC and OCC, there's no deadline here. Right. So technically, if they really wanted to, they could probably find a way to kick this down the road forever. I agree with everything that Jim just said. The, other, the one caveat I would say is, one, we have the election coming up in November. There's a lot of lacking regulatory clarity. I think there's a chance that we could get regulatory clarity that a lot of people in this room would not like the clarity that is provided. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of caveats here, and I think the, the industry that is overlapping, you know, the, the TradFi world, is trying to help bring that clarity, and, and there's a lot of education happening. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... The other thing I would say is the UX and UI specifically in DeFi and in crypto is very hard. It's hard to compete with like something like the ETFs where you can literally just click buy. It's all connected to your bank account. It's very easy to do. So I think as UX, UI gets better and more people, the younger crowd gets older, I think it'll get better. But I, I agree with everything Jim said. The, the ETFs are not the be-all, end-all, but also I think they are a net positive um, for, for where we're going and what they're doing. Nice. Well said. Well, can't thank you both enough for joining us today at Permissionless. It's really great to have you both. And yeah, I guess we'll just have to see where these ETFs pan out from here. And obviously, like you said, a lot of it is going to be dependent on this election outcome. So we'll see from there. But yeah, thank you both for joining and it's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.